morning, everybody. Good morning. Come on. Good morning. And we're, I'm Ruth Katz. I'm a director of the Health Medicine Society program here at the Aspen Institute, one of the co-producers of Spotlight Health. We're delighted to have you here for the first full day. Uh, for those of you who were here yesterday, I hope you would agree we got off to a great start. And we're going to get off to a great start this morning. I want to introduce our moderator for this morning's session. By the way, we're going to have people funneling in. We have some people up on Maroon Bells that are coming back from, uh, coming from their bus ride, uh, hiking at 7 o'clock this morning. So anyway, it's my great pleasure, great personal pleasure, to introduce Margot Sanger Katz, who is a domestic correspondent with the New York Times, where she covers health care for the upshot. Um, for those of you who were with us late last night, 9 to 10 o'clock, we had a special session with Margot and two other health, uh, top-notch health reporters like Margot talking about the Senate bill that was released yesterday. The room was absolutely packed. I think they could have gone past 10 o'clock. So I tell you, you've got a great moderator right here, and it's my pleasure to turn the program over to her. Perfect. Thank you all for being here. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for getting up early to come talk to us about the future of medicine in some ways and medical uh, care delivery. Um, I just want to introduce my panel here. Uh, this is uh, David Holmberg, who is the president and CEO of Highmark Health, which is a uh, health insurer, uh, but also a health healthcare provider. Um, uh, over here in the white is uh, <laughs> uh, Deborah DeSanzo, who is the, no, the general manager for Watson Health, uh, which is doing many interesting things around how technology and data can improve our healthcare, which you'll tell us about. And all the way to my left is uh, Ken Davis, who's the president and CEO of uh, the Mount Sinai Health System in New York. And uh, I have been uh, spending the last few days thinking very much about the present maelstrom of debate in Washington about sort of health policy. Louder, Louder okay. Um, but I'm excited because this panel in some ways is really about the future of medicine and what medicine is going to look like. Uh, to some degree, it will be influenced by these policy decisions, and I hope we can talk about that later. But um, I think a lot of us have this idea that uh, medicine is delivered by sort of a single doctor who is this person that you know well, and they're wise, and they're your friend, and they know everything. And I think we're starting to learn that that system doesn't make a whole lot of sense anymore and is maybe not the way that medical decisions are going to be delivered in the future because of various pressures, or maybe that they should be. So I want to just open by asking each of our panelists sort of when they look into the future, who do you think uh, should be making the most important decisions about the kind of health care people get, and who do you think will be? All right, so uh, thanks for pointing to me, David. I'm, <laughs> I'm probably the least qualified person up here to answer that question. But, but I, I think I want to tell a little bit of our experience with, with, um, with oncology. So if, 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 you think about, if you think about oncology and you think about when a person is diagnosed with, uh, with, with, with a cancer and they go to see maybe their community oncologist or maybe even they're an oncologist in a, um, uh, a tertiary medical center in a, in, a, in a big city, they are getting the benefit of where that physician went to school, when that physician trained, what the last article that phys physician read. And, and our physicians are extraordinarily um, smart and gifted and want to do the best thing for their patients. But if you think about, there are 8,000, the, the um, data now is that there are 8,000 new pieces of information published on health every single day. And so it gets pretty difficult for physicians to keep up with the amount of information that's published, published every day. And if you look at the size of our electronic health records now, an average, an average electronic health record for a week's stay is 1,000 pages long. So now you have a physician who has 15 minutes with their patient, and they need to look into the electronic health record, and they need to be up to date on all the latest treatments in, in medicines. We know, we absolutely know that technology can help with that. Watson reads millions and millions of pages of, of data every month, and then we take that data and make the invisible data visible for physicians so that he knows when he's seeing this oncology patient that the recommendations that are coming out of Watson for oncology are for that patient, and it's the, the very latest research. 
I would just say from my perspective, I mean, uh, we're a payer and a provider, so you know, we have a hospital system, you know, we're an insurer, and we're data rich and insight poor. Uh, I, I think medicine and, and healthcare is a combination of uh, art and science, and the science is moving exponentially. Um, and so, you know, so it can be very disjointed uh, if we're not very, uh, careful. I think there's a unique opportunity for all of us now uh, for a variety of reasons where there can be real innovation and real change. And that starts with uh, putting the patient in the center, uh, putting the, you know, going to more of a, a consumer-focused approach, and building a team of tools and resources around them that's based on where they're at in their lifestyle. And I think if we do that, you can take the power of the data and you can, um, you know, and, and I believe that you have to be, uh, have a physician-led strategy, but you, you can empower the physician with more information that's, um, you know, that's much more precise in making decisions and, and helping guide that patient. So, if I recall, your question was, who's going to influence the future of healthcare the most? And um, that's very hard to answer because it depends on the circumstance. I think lots of different constituencies have vetoes over what we do. So in, in my world, um, patients can be decisive because if patients don't show up, we're out of business. Um, payers have an awful lot to say about what we do and what the future of medicine is going to be like. Payers are insurers. Really, right. But, but you know, it's also Medicare and Medicaid. I mean, most of the payers are federal. Um, so what happens yesterday in the Senate, what happened a month ago in the House, has enormous influence on what the future of medicine is going to look like. So the payers have a lot to say about it. Um, and I wish I could say the doctors had a lot to say about it. But um, for the most part, I think we are the providers of care, and uh, we try to do the best we can, but feel like we're in an ocean that uh, is turbulent all around us, but we don't have a whole lot of influence over what happens. Um, some, but perhaps not as much as patients and payers. So, uh, David, you mentioned this idea of having the patient at the center of their care, and I feel like this is an idea that we hear a lot from people in the healthcare industry, and it's something that I've been hearing a lot from politicians lately, the idea that we should have a patient-centered healthcare system. And it's, I have to just confess, it's one of these terms that whenever I hear it, it just kind of like whooshes over my head. I have no idea what people are talking about. Um, and I, I don't know what it means, but it, it feels important because everyone is talking about it. Everyone thinks that patient-centered is what we need. What do you mean, well, I guess what does everyone mean? When you say patient-centered and you think about a future that has to be centered around the patient, what kinds of values are built into that? What, 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 are, what are you talking about? Well, I, I mean, my background is consumer, and, and, and so I, I came into healthcare um, maybe a little different perspective. And I started thinking about it in terms of any other consumer market and, you know, and what do patients and customers want uh, from the system when they purchase products, no different than when they purchase things in the rest of their lifestyle. We have a healthcare system that was built post-World War II uh, to tackle the biggest problems of the time, which were you know, accidents and infections. And today we have a healthcare uh, need, the consumer's need is dominated by chronic disease. You know, uh, congestive heart failure, diabetes, COPD, you pick your, the, the, the subject. And what that requires is more of an individualized solution for, you know, for each person. And I, I think that uh, a patient-centered or consumer-centered means, you know, you start with the individual and you say what's important to them and where are they at in their life cycle and then you build capabilities and teams around them. Um, and so it, it's, it's reordering the process, and, it, and it's, instead of it being about us, it's gotta be about them. Can you guys give an example of what, what you mean? Sure, um, diabetes program. I mean, uh, so, well, let, me, let me give you two examples. If you're 25 and pregnant, and, you know, and you're, you know, this is your first child, your priorities and what you need are totally different, uh, not only from a payer standpoint, uh, but from your providers than somebody who's 64, who's about to retire, who's pre-diabetic, and probably doesn't know it. Um, and so, you know, so you, know, you have to uh, customize the solution around them. And by doing that, you know, you know, for example, the 64-year-old, you, know, you, you, know, you can engage them in a very proactive primary care-based diabetic program. Uh, and for the 25-year-old, 
you know, you can start to plot out, you know, using Watson and other tools, start to plot out what their trajectory will be, you know, over the next five to 10 years and be proactive with them if you have the insights. And so, so it's about thinking about what's important to them and then providing the services that they specifically need um, at that point in their life set. I can give actually, I can give a, a, a nice patient-centric view from a, from a Watson perspective actually. Um, we, one of our partners is Medtronic. Medtronic makes a continuous glucose monitor and, and has for, for, for many, many years. Now we worked with Medtronic on a couple of things. One is, can we create algorithms that can help predict highs and lows? And it turns out that we can. But even more importantly now, we have, we have a, a patient-centered app on a cell phone, but it's not just, it's called Sugar IQ, and it's not just an app, it is actually tied to a patient's continuous glucose monitor. And we can show patients their highs and their lows depending upon what they eat. We can show depending on when you woke up, when you walked, when you ate, what you ate, what your highs and lows are. And in there's 263 people in the study right now, um, and we've seen amazing things. 37 30, um, on, on average, patients are staying within their glucose range for 37 more minutes a day. 65% of people have had fewer highs. 55% of people have had fewer lows. And why is this able to happen? Well, first of all, it's giving the person the insight into when you eat your Dunkin' Donuts, this is what happens to your glucose level, and seeing it is driving a modification in behavior. But then we're also, from watching when they like to walk, when they like to eat, what they like to eat, what motivates them, Watson will learn from the motivations, and we're tuning the behavioral nudges directly to what works for that patient, and we're seeing much better, uh, much better outcomes in this patient population than we see in just giving broad guidelines. So when I was a medical student, um, it was a doctor-centric world. Uh, that was a long time ago, but in the kind of places that were like Mount Sinai, you know, great medical centers, um, doctors were iconic figures. And to get an appointment with some of these doctors was like a big deal. So if a doctor said, in order to see me, you're going to have to wait two weeks or three weeks, doctors thought that was fine. Patients didn't like it that much, but they said, well, you know, I'm going to see one of the giants of medicine, and it was all okay. That's changed. Patient-centric for us means patients come first. Access is critical. It's access to the doctor, and it's not only access to the doctor, it's access to their data. Um, and I see that that's the very, very big change. Um, and for a lot of medical centers, that's been hard to do. For a lot of doctors, that's been hard to do. And one of the fallouts of patient-centricity, with patients demanding appropriately that, you know, their doctor is available 24-7, that they can email them whenever they want, they can text them whenever they want, they can get answers whenever they want, is this whole movement towards concierge medicine. Because it's very hard for a lot of doctors to be able to provide that kind of 24-7 coverage that patients increasingly demand. I, I would just add to that, and, and um, you know, access is a critical issue. I mean, it's obviously an issue nationally. But in Western Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh specifically, it was 18 days to get to see a specialist. And, you know, we introduced same-day appointments for not only primary care, for, but for specialists. And that was a sea change, of, uh, you know, from a cultural standpoint, to get um, specialists to open up their appointment books, to extend hours, to do different things. But, you know, we've been averaging, you know, 3,000 additional specialist appointments a week. And we're starting to see people who just kept putting things off. And because it was three weeks, they just never made the appointment. Yeah, right. And now they're starting to get care. That's, that's critical. That's changing the game. That's absolutely critical. Why has this been so hard? I, you know, I mostly interact with the healthcare system as a reporter, but as a patient. And it's just amazing how unwieldy it is and how kind of not customer service friendly it can be. There's so much burden that we put on patients to navigate the system to you know tote their records from place to place to research who the right person is to get an appointment and you know often wait in a waiting room for hours in the middle of a work day like like how do we how do we fix that i mean how and, and how how much cultural change and, and challenge has it been for you guys to achieve the improvements you have it's it's hard 
um, we started to put on the front page of our website same day appointments. Um, and then facilitated through that website access to the various physicians. And, and as we were talking about, um, physicians don't want to open up their schedule. Uh, it's, it's hard to do. I think what we're seeing is a tension between what increasingly patients demand appropriately and what the healthcare system is able to provide. Um, this is a system that's under severe financial stress. Uh, in our system, for instance, which is you know eight hospitals and 36,000 employees, um, we have about 25% Medicaid. Now, what that means is we're losing money on every one of those patients. Um, we're losing 13 cents in the dollar on the, you know, in an inpatient and 23 cents in the dollar on an outpatient. And yet, we want to give those people, because as a core value, the same level of service as everybody else. And when the consequence of all that is with a top line of nearly $8 billion and a bottom line of $80 million, you're taking 1% down, everybody's under a great deal of stress. Um, hours are extended. Um, patients, perhaps, are waiting longer than they wish they could because the system just doesn't have the resources that they would like to be able to be as great as they might be. And for a place that's in an, you know, an urban area like we are, where there is great disparity in, eco in economics and the healthcare system is committed to treating everybody equally, um, it's a real stress to be able to meet the access demands that are appropriate that you are talking about and to be as patient-centric as you'd like to be. You know, you mentioned the financial stress that the healthcare system is under, and you know, it's sort of unavoidable. It's this huge part of our economy. It's a growing part of our economy, and healthcare costs are crowding out a lot of other priorities that you know we would like to have as a country. Um, you know, a big part of the reason why we're having a debate about health reform in Washington right now is because it's just so expensive to provide health insurance to so many people in the way that we do right now. How do you think about this kind of growing? problem of the expensiveness of healthcare and how did it you know how does it sort of bump up against some of these other values you know it occurs to me that if you have a healthcare system that is really patient focused that is really customer service focused where people can get in and see a specialist on any old day that they want that maybe what that leads to is people seeking care that's unnecessary or that's needlessly expensive or maybe you run out of resources and there's some group that gets left out is there, is there a role for technology in trying to improve the efficiency? What are, like, what are the ways that healthcare can I mean, sort of meet patients where they are, help patients where they are, but not be sort of unsustainably expensive and growing? So, so let me take a swing at it. I mean, first of all, I, I agree completely about, I mean, you know, our, our organization is, is focused on creating access to care, improving quality, uh, improving safety, and getting better outcomes. Uh, most people talk about value in healthcare as, as those things divided by cost. We talk about um, uh, increasing uh, quality and better outcomes and access divided by affordability. Because that's the real issue. I mean, uh, you know, forgetting about the politics for a minute, what we're seeing in Washington, what we've seen for the last decade, is there's not enough money. I mean, there's not enough money uh, to sustain the system that we have today, and it's broken. So that creates a very unique opportunity for everybody in this room because uh, we're at a transformational moment you know, where um, you can either raise more taxes and try to create more money to pump into the system, or you can deny care you know, if, if that's, uh, uh, or, or, or limit access, or you can come up and reinvent the future of healthcare. And I think the future of healthcare is really focusing on, uh, on value-based care, not volume. Uh, what it means to me is, is um, you know, is is making sure that you, you know, you give the consumer, empower the consumer, and the physicians to make the right decision for the patient. Uh, that you, you know, you reorder you know, the reimbursement systems so that you encourage more care to be delivered in the communities, in more convenient consumer settings, and there are things that you can do there. You encourage innovation that improves quality and outcomes but also recognizes it's got to be affordable and scalable across the broader population. Because if you want to take care of everybody, you know, and you want to have access to care, there's got to be a way to fund that, and, and there's got to be a way to deliver that, deliver that. 
and then you know, and then you have to figure out a way to protect the um, the high quality acute centers where you know the, the complex care needs to be delivered. You know, where when somebody's truly uh, sick, that you know, if they need to be to have a, a heart surgery or something that is done in the proper setting. My simple example is, um, you know, if an MRI it can be done for your ankle, and it can be done in a um, in a quaternary center, or it can be done in a community site. You know, if it's more affordable, $500 in the in the community site versus $4,000, you know, in uh, in the the academic center, you know. You got to figure those things out and start, you know, making the reimbursements work so that you build the capabilities, you know, in the in the uh, you know, the, the, uh, the acute centers, but you find different ways to deliver care that uh, is less expensive. So and to more put accessible. this to put this in a historical context to put some make this simpler for some of every for everybody who doesn't know what we're talking about, uh, medicine was and it's still in many places fee for service, which means. The doctor is incentivized to do as many things as they can do. The hospital is incentivized to do so as many things as they service. can do. You come in for a doctor's appointment, right. the doctor gets and paid a fee. They remove a mole from you, they get paid a fee. They right. give you a knee surgery, they get paid a fee. And so the way the doctors traditionally have been paid is kind of for each widget that they do. Right. Or hospitals. <clears throat> so until a few years ago, if a patient was readmitted, and even if that readmission was the fault of the hospital, the hospital's getting paid for that. So there wasn't an incentive to do less. There wasn't an incentive to be efficient. Um, what value means is that we're getting paid to keep people well. We're getting paid a lump of money ahead of time as an agreement with an insurance company that says, if you're going to take care of these 200,000 people, this is how much money you're going to get. Now the incentive is to keep people well. Now the incentive is to keep people out of the emergency room, to have the MRI done in the least expensive place, to be as affordable as possible. Um, now that's, that's really a sea change in medicine because it suddenly aligns the doctor with the patient and the payer in which everyone is aligned to keep people well. And that sounds great. I mean, you know, it, and for the macroeconomics of healthcare, it's certainly better than fee-for-service medicine. The issue that we all should be sensitive about is we tried things like this in the 90s. We called them HMOs, and patients hated them because their care was essentially de facto being rationed. That somebody is saying, wait a minute, I don't want you to see that specialist. You may think you need to see a cardiologist, but we don't think you need to see a cardiologist. Um, or in the case of really super specialty hospitals like we can be, um, we have doctors who are always looking for the unusual diagnosis in the very difficult patient who's not getting better. And that patient requires a lot of extra tests. And it just builds up and builds up and builds up the cost. At some point, someone has to say, what's the likelihood that all those extra tests are really going to provide the answer that we need that will miraculously cure this patient? When I was a medical student and we would round, we would always be amazed at the brilliant, iconic physician who figured out what was wrong with the patient that nobody else could figure out, and he did the most extraordinary test that anybody would have even thought of. Today, we teach our medical students, you don't do that. Right? When I was a medical student, we were told, if you think you might need that test, you do that test. Now we say, no, no, no. If you think that there's a reason that that test is going to show you something very important, you should do that test. Now, what does that ultimately mean? It means that we're going to miss things in a, in a value-oriented system. And what we haven't really calculated is what's the value of a single human life. And how important is it for us to spend that extra money to save that occasional patient? And we shouldn't lose sight of that's going to be the value proposition when we move to this new way of reimbursing people in medicine. And, and Technology that, can help. Bingo. And so I want to talk, I want to talk about... I want you to should talk hope about it three, should help. I, 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 I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about access to specialists. I want to talk about reducing the variability of care. And I want to talk about how we can make more of the tests that are done. So access to specialists. Um, why, why we put Watson for Oncology in rural areas of China and India first was because they did not have, act, they, they maybe didn't have oncologists, they certainly did not have, have access to world-class oncologists. And so now we bring to a part, and by the way, 
we think we don't have access to physicians here. In China, you get, when you go to see your oncologist, you see them for three minutes, three minutes. So what we, we work, use Watson for oncology, we're democratizing the healthcare, and we're, we're, we're providing to people in rural areas of the world the same expertise that you can get in downtown New York City. And it gives peace of mind both to the oncologist that's treating that patient as well as to the patient. So there is using technology, you can expand. Boston Children's Hospital, for example, we did a program with them called Open Pediatrics that took the knowledge of Boston Children's to also rural places in our country and other parts of the world. So Access to like care. The oncologist in China, what, are, mm -hmm. like, what do you see, what makes you like the you know, big time expert? So you, you, so we, we derive the information, Watson derives the information from the patient that it needs to understand what's going on in the patient. If there's an electronic health record, we search through the entire electronic health record. So lots of times there are things in the electronic health record, they're very long, it's difficult to look through it, but technology like Watson can look through it. So we'll derive from the electronic health record what's necessary to understand the condition of the patient. And once that's done, then Watson will, you know, I don't want to make this sound tremendously easy. It's not. We've been doing this for six years. We've been training Watson for six years in oncology. And then once derived from the patient record, Watson will recommend, based on the 200 textbooks, 300 medical journals, 24 million PubMed articles, millions of patient records, and training from Memorial Sloan Kettering, what the highest probability of treatment is for this patient. And it's very, it's green, green recommendations, yellow, and red. Now the physician is still in charge, it's still his choice, but he knows that something has looked through the entire patient record and, and with, all the, with all the training that's gone into Watson recommending these things. It could be, we, I was saying yesterday that in Florida, we have a patient now talking about how their oncologist using Watson found an immuno-oncology drug that had um, just recently been approved that worked for him and how grateful he is for that. So, so you, can take, you can take the specialists, you can, um, use, you, you can use technology to help read the information and then you can make um, more specialized choices that work for that patient. This also reduces the variability of care because we know there must be paths that work best for the diabetes for a particular diabetes patient. There must be paths that work better for a um, congestive heart failure patient. And if you can use technology to help find those best paths, you can reduce the variability of care and reduce the cost of care. Yeah, I agree with that completely. And I think part of it too is is you have to figure out a way because. Uh, you know, I, I went through, you know, uh, as a patient, you know, the, the uh, early days, the HMO days that you described, they almost killed my son. And, you know, uh, today, and that's why I'm so passionate about, we have to give, um, you know, the, the, the clinicians the tools they need so that, you know, so that we can make good value decisions, you know, on what the level of care is. And what's beautiful about today is, there's this world of capability and knowledge, and, and the, the trick is to figure out how to simplify it and get it to the point of contact. So whether it's in China or in a primary care um, office in Tulsa, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, in a 10 minute visit, they're only gonna be able to do so much. So if you can give them some tools that are simple, that'll help them, them determine the best path, that's where the art and science meets the road, is right in front of, of, of the customer or the patient. I think the conversation that we're having about technology is important, but we might need to broaden it. Um, computers have become enormously powerful. Um, Watson's not alone in the world. Um, you know, the very, very fast chips allow computations to go at extraordinary speeds. So we have supercomputers in our facility, and we've been doing some deep learning and uh, finding out how smart our computers can be compared to our doctors. And um, we find out, for instance, that with deep learning, our computers going through the database that we already have and learning themselves can become just as effective as pathologists in reading slides. How, how do feel about that? Well, it, you know, it's going to revolutionize medicine. Um, our computer, again, deep learning and artificial intelligence can become as good as a radiologist. Uh, so what we're going to be seeing over the next 10 years, I think across all of medicine, 
is the use of technology in ways that we've never thought was possible. I mean, it's conceivable that as we think, you know, 20, 25 years down the line, with electronic medical records that might be completely compatible, that you might be able to just get on your mobile device um, and talk to some computer somewhere who's got all your electronic medical records and all your diagnostic information, and you're going to give them some new information from apps that you have on your body, and that computer's going to make a diagnosis and going to outline the treatment. Um, it's a little frightening, but, you know, we talk about the possibility that automated driving is going to make truck drivers obsolete. Uh, automated diagnostics are going to change medicine over the next 25 years in ways we can't even conceptualize. And we, and, and we really feel passionately that, we're, that, that deep learning in Watson is not going to take over a physician's role. But since we're headed for, for a place where we have very, very, very fewer and a shortage of clinicians, and clinicians are, are um, suffering from depression and other and other unhappiness about their work today, that what technology can do, if you can, if you can read through all your, your records very fast, and if you can find the best paths, then this fundamentally helps the physician, physician do its job. And if we have a shortage of physicians, then it helps the nurse practitioners or whoever else help the physicians do their jobs better. So I want to make sure that we have time for questions from the audience. And um, there are microphones at, uh, on the back on either side, and they will come to you. Um, I always feel like I just have to give a caution that do ask a question, don't give a speech. Um, uh, yes, over here. Great presentation. Uh, my name is Kurt Malkoff. I'm a PhD clinical psychologist who has a company that provides large scale mental health services to major enterprises throughout the country. With that said, I applaud medicine coming around to a patient-focused direction. Uh, business has been talking about that for, you know, 50 years with customer focus. My question is, that's 15 percent of the equation. If medicine is the only business that has a customer forever, what are we doing to train the patient in being a compliant patient? One last thing. Jane Brody, about three weeks ago, had an op-ed in the New York Times talking about non-compliance. It's like 50 percent, you know, people get a script, they fill it, don't fill it, whatever. How are we addressing that piece? How are we teaching the patient to be a compliant patient? I think that's a great question. Um, because what we didn't talk about when we talked about value and the inefficiencies in the system is what we're doing so that those things don't happen. I mean, care coordination is critical, reaching out to patients all the time. We can identify, you know, with the help of our electronic medical record, uh, people who are not that compliant, um, or because of predictions that we can make about sociodemographic factors that these people, a particular group of people, are high risk for readmission, high risk for the emergency room, and it's, all that is being driven by poor compliance. So what we do is increasingly have community workers and case workers who are out there talking to those patients, making contact almost on a daily basis. Um, and I think that that's, that's got to be the future, because patients are going to be patients, and we lose sight, I think, of the pressures that they're under and the factors that lead to noncompliance. And if we don't put a team around them, um, we're not going to be as effective as we need to be. We, um, we have a population health program, um, and we have 35 million patients in the U.S. that go through population health. So, you know, for the past seven years, population health has really been identify the patients at most risk, identify the patients who are going to crash in the next three months, six months, a year, and then reach out to them by phone. And, and, and what you see is sometimes, however you reach out, it works for some portion of patients, not enough. What we really are finding now, though, is if you use cognitive technologies and you you, and behavioral economics, and you tune the messages and the way you reach those patients to what they need, it works much better. We did a, a program at Mercy Health 
in, in Cincinnati, and we found that in a year, we were able to reduce admissions by 57% and readmissions by 37%, and we were able to increase the amount of screenings in compliance. But it really is not, not behavior pushes to 10,000 women like me, but behavior pushes that work directly for me. And, and so we'll get better and better and better. Technology will be, get better and better and better to tune what you do per patient. A whole bunch of opportunities there. Part of it also is we've got to take the waste out of the system and then redeploy those dollars into care management. You know, we need to look at complex care. Um, you, know, you know, mental health, 37% of the, we have eight hospitals, 37% of the emergency room visits we see have a mental health component. Um, you know, we've partnered with Quartet to provide, you know, resources for primary care physicians so that when they have a patient who's in there for seven or ten minutes, and they recognize there's more going on here than their foot hurts. You know, we got to move away from being transactional and being more proactive in managing the population. So we're working with Quartet to, to, to marry them up with resources and to have a warm handoff for the patient, you know, um, you know doing things like that. It, it's, about, it's about not being transactional anymore, but you know, being uh, holistic in our approach with them. Uh, and then frankly, there are some patients that just aren't going to be compliant. I mean, we have 20% of the cancer patients that we see don't finish their meds. You know, that's a problem. So, so we've got to work on that. My father keeps eating his lasagna even though he's a uh, diabetic and congestive heart failure. I say, Dad, you feel bad because you ate the lasagna, but <laughs> I haven't found that behavioral nudge that works for him. Uh, right here in the middle. Hi. Will you just wait? Oh, sorry, the, I think they're recording, so the microphone's coming your way. They're recording, so they want you to wait for the microphone. Eisenberg from uh, PBS Next Avenue. I'm wondering, how do we get to value-based and patient-centered care? You said that patients didn't like HMOs. Most people can't afford concierge care. So what's the reality? Yeah, that's a terrific question. Um, I think part of the reason that, that HMOs failed is because the gatekeepers were the insurance companies. I think when the gatekeeper is your primary care physician and you trust your primary care physician, it's a lot easier for value to take over. So that's what we're trying to do. Empower the primary care physician, make sure that they have a meaningful relationship with that patient. It's a trusting relationship. So when they say, you know, I need a specialist because my stomach hurts, I better see a GI specialist, that physician could say, wait a minute, I think we can handle that. Um, so it's taking the decision making and putting it in the hands of the dyad patient physician rather than what it was, which was insurance company patient. So as a, um, you know, we're uh, the Blue Cross Blue Shield plan for most of Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Delaware, and we have the Allegheny Health Network, which is eight hospitals, about 2,800 physicians. I agree 100% needs to be the primary care physician or the, or the physician needs to be the gatekeeper. Um, I think you have to, you know, reset the in incentives in the system so that, you know, the, the, the decision that's made at that point, you know, starts to, you know, the, the journey. Today, we have too many people who decide their stomach hurts, so what do they do? They go to a specialist. You know, um, my father is 89. He has, uh, he, his diabetes is under control. He does a great job with it. He does not need to see a specialist you know, maybe once a year, if that, because he's very active with his primary care physician. Um, but we have lots of patients who have multiple, you know, issues, comor comorbidities, uh, who, you know, who just sort of leap around the system and go to the emergency room. You've got to stop that, you know, and, and it has to be such that, you know, that the system doesn't encourage it and that we hold people accountable for their decisions. So the session started off with what's on t everybody's top of mind in terms of repealing and replacing Obamacare. In what ways is whatever it looks like, the repeal and replacement of Obamacare, convergent or divergent with value-based care? Um, I'll take a swing at it. I mean, uh, you know, and, and again, I want to stay away from politics because I think what we're seeing is the, you know, the angst and all the pressure and everything that's going on is about the fundamental issue, you know, it, um, which is we've got to transform healthcare. 
you know, we had, you know, we had uh, for the last decade, you know, we've had a desire to expand care to more people. Now we have, you know, a, um, a, a desire to figure out how to, you know, to maybe make that more affordable and refine it in a different way. Um, I'm not going to. I think it's unavoidable that if this, if either of these Republican bills become law, there will be, you know, 10, 10 to 25 million more Americans without insurance. I mean, I, I think, I mean, if, if, if we don't figure out a different way to invest the dollars, um, you know, and it, it, it'll make it very difficult for, uh, for anyone in the decision-making position to be able to make this work. We have to find a different way to deliver care. We truly believe that access to care is important. Uh, I mean, I, I concur with what, you know, was said over here. But, you know, I taught my kids, you know, when markets go up, markets go down, there's opportunity because there's movement. We're in, in another round of movement here, and, and the people in this room have an opportunity to be innovators and come up with ideas that actually deliver more effective care and find ways to give access but make it more affordable. See, There's simple things you can do to make that happen, I, I, and the system has to reinforce that. I think um, you know, part of the answer to your question is to keep in mind that all these bills, no matter what they pass, are not addressing the question of how to make health care more efficient. Um, that isn't a part of this legislation. That hasn't been a part of the debate. You don't hear people on either side of the aisle talking a great deal about why is the macroeconomics of health care going south? Why can't the employer, the employee, the government, whoever it is, afford health care? Um, what kind of reforms are really necessary so that the system becomes more efficient? This is, a lot of this bill is about taking Medicaid off the table, and that's about saving a lot of money. So I think a lot of this is being driven by, you know, the politics of our time and ways to, uh, uh, you know, find a tax cut down the road. But the, the bill also, I think, is trying to shift more people into plans that have very high deductibles and trying to, I think, trying yeah, to but that's, people that's, that's by to, default. to be more judicious in their use of health care by giving them more of a financial stake in what they need. How does that bump up against what you guys are trying to do in, you know, well, delivering well, all this intensive primary care and care coordination and everything else if, if people have to pay for all this at the upfront? I have to speak to this as a psychiatrist and as a person who runs a big medical center. Um, there are lots of people who have psychiatric comorbidity. When you take that out of the essential plan, what happens is all those people who deny that that's a problem wind up finding out that they don't have coverage. So that a family may know that uh, some member of their cohort is, is depressed, but the part of mental illness is denial. And that person, when they have to choose a policy, they don't think they need a benefit that includes mental health. Um, but ultimately, 20% or more of healthcare dollars are gonna wind up being spent that way. So by taking that out of the essential plan, you know, taking that, out of, taking that out of the plan, we're going to increase the likelihood that people are going to get sicker longer and be harder to treat. Um, and high deductibles, what high deductibles do in, in a community like ours is they keep people from getting care. And if our focus is on prevention, it's the worst thing that we can do is discourage people from having routine visits and preventive care. So I'm a technologist. I lived in, I lived in um, the Netherlands for three years, and I really loved my universal health care in the Netherlands that I had to pay for, but I loved it. But, but in, in, uh, when I lived there, all the costs were rising, costs were rising, costs were rising here. And, and I came back, and this is what gave me hope. I started to go see all the healthcare technology companies and the startups that were forming in the Silicon Valley and in, 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 in Boston and in New York, and I found these ter terrific technologies like WellTalk, which provides real information to patients about how to take care of themselves better. And, and I found Watson, who helps reduce the variability of care. And the woman yesterday who, who, taught, who, who did her brave idea and, and showed um, you know, how you can get blood tests simply. And I came away thinking, um, we have a political debate going on, but we are America, and we have a startup mentality, and we have entrepreneurs. And I, I'm actually very hopeful that all the technology that is coming down is going to fundamentally, fundamentally help us reduce the cost of care in this country. And if we can reduce the cost of care, then it's going to get much better for everyone.
So I think on that optimistic and slightly political note, we have to wrap up, which is sort of unfortunate because I see hands everywhere. But maybe our panelists can stick around for a few minutes and try to answer some questions before we scurry to our next thing. Uh, thank you guys all so much for coming, getting up early. Uh, and thank, thank you to our panelists for their really smart insights. Thank you for having us.